Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to this episode of Tripod. I am here talking with my buddy Nick Page, and today we are going to chat a little bit about long lenses for wildlife and and uh, landscape photography. So, landscape photography, I for the first several years that I shot landscapes, I don't think I ever busted out the 7200. Um, you know, everyone, I'd get a detail photo like, uh, you know, water on a leaf. I saw you posted a, f a picture mm -hmm. of that this week, Nick, of just, you know, a little water drop coming off a, a leaf or something like that. But like of a, of a true landscape, I don't think I took any 7200 kind of long lens landscape until I was, I was several years in. Is that the same for you, Nick? Yeah, it's definitely the same for me. Like, I think everybody has an easier time envisioning the big wide shot just because that's kind of what we see with our own eyes anyways. We see like, look at this huge scene. I want to photograph it. And trying to visualize those longer lens shots are just, uh, it's a little bit challenging. It's something that you have to get accustomed to to, uh, to scene. But once you do, the impact that they can have is really quite dramatic because uh, when you use a longer focal length, there's a lot of really nice things that happen. It compresses the scene, so that mountain in the background becomes towering and big and ominous and impressive. You shoot that with a wide-angle lens, and it becomes small and cute. So <laughs> if you want big, ominous mountains, you have to use those longer focal lengths. And, it, and so longer, long focal lengths are one of those things that I'm incorporating more into my photography. Uh, but it's hard to – in the beginning, it's really hard to visualize. Yeah, it is. And I, I would say right now when I go out and I'm, you know, I'm shooting landscapes, I would say I put the 70 to 200 in my bag, maybe uh, one out of every four or one out of every five times. Mm -hmm. I'm still just kind of working into it. But the biggest problem that I have is kind of training my eye to see those things. Uh, like I know they're there because I'm seeing some landscape photographers kind of shooting in this I don't know if you can call it a new style, but, th but this different style, at least, of the long lens landscape. Um, but uh, but I, I'm still working because I still only see those big, wide photos, mm -hmm. you know, maximum 20 millimeters on a full frame camera is usually what I'm doing. Uh, but I, I'm starting to see that what patterns I should be looking for that make sense for a long lens. So one of those things that I'm that I'm looking for when I'm trying to find those those long lens landscapes is something that uh, that has depth to it, but that that depth doesn't start close to you. Right. So for example, you know you're shooting in in Tuscany uh, where there are just these beautiful rolling hills, or Nick, you have the Palouse up by you, just mm -hmm. these rolling farm farms. Uh, well, you're not necessarily on the hill that you want to be in the foreground, but there's good depth between that hill that you're seeing and the one behind it. It's a perfect situation for that long lens. And the mistake I was making before is I was looking for long lens things as things that were just background, you know, like zooming in on, on the sun setting over the water and you just have sun going <laughs> under <laughs> horizon. It just looks, it just mm -hmm. looks boring. So that's the wrong place to be doing long lens photography. You still need that depth of foreground, midground, background to make most long lens landscapes work. Right. And the nice part of using a long lens like that, when you have that depth, it compresses it all together. So um, they end up, you know, being very much more, I guess, intimate with each other because it, it just feels so compressed. And, and like, for example, if you have this long winding road that ends with a mountain in the background, that's the perfect time for a land for a long lens shot because it just compresses all of it together and it makes that mountain larger. And it, it, it just, it's a style of photo that you can only get with a long lens. Um, another time that I really like it is, uh, uh, you know, during sunset, Sometimes the entire sky doesn't just blow up. Sometimes it's just like on the horizon or just a little bit or, you know, over here to the right, there's just some clouds that have a gap in them and they're taking on color. But the rest of the sky is kind of meh. So that's a perfect time for a long lens shot because you can really fill the frame with where the action is because, you know, it's a very rare sky that, you know, the entire sky blows up. But more often than not, you can find that little bit of interest in the sky. And if you can fill the frame with that interest, it's going to make for a more interesting photo. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the absolute king of this, like the best long lens landscape photographer, um, if, if, if that's like a category that we're allowed to have, <laughs> is got to be Michael, Michael Fry. Fry. Uh, he's, uh, just he's just absolutely, absolutely awesome. awesome. Um, um, many, many of you have probably, you have probably heard, heard of him. He's, he's a pretty well-known well photographer. photographer. Um, um, he, shoots he shoots a lot, a lot in, in, in Yosemite. Yosemite. But, but if, if you, you look, look at his photos, photos I'm going to say maybe... 70% of his, of his landscape, landscape photos are pretty, pretty obviously, obviously shot with a, a, a relatively long lens, lens, at least a, a, a much, much longer lens, lens than most of us would shoot with. with. Um, um, and, and, and one, one thing that has really helped, helped me in, uh, in, uh, in learning this longer, longer lens, lens technique, technique uh, is, uh, to, is just to just follow his, his Facebook page. page. It, like, it's, like it's totally worth it. Worth checking, checking is just, just go to just, just search Michael Fry photography. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a link in the in the show notes as well. Um, um, and he has a website that's great too. But I I just follow his Facebook and just, and just to start, start to get an eye for the way that he's seeing these landscapes is pretty neat. And, and, you know, it's you know, not it's something not that I would probably, probably want to do with all of my photos, photos but, but it's it's, uh, it's definitely a technique that I'm trying to add right. into my repertoire. A lot of times the type of landscapes that I'm seeing that uh, just lend itself really well to a long lens are mountains. Um, because anytime you can really focus in on the peak of the mountain, a lot of times that's the most dramatic part just because that's where uh, oftentimes the weather is happening. You get low clouds rolling in front of the mountains or, you know, you, you get s dark storm clouds interacting with the, the tips of the mountains. So some of my favorite landscape photography that I've seen are really jagged, uh, dramatic pe peaks shot from another peak, but with a long lens. And it takes you in close to this part of a landscape that people like me don't ever get to see because I'm never going to climb up there. <laughs> but, but, but it, it's that, uh, it's that different, that different perspective that makes a photo interesting. A lot of times, um, I taught, taught a workshop this weekend and that was kind of one of the things that I was talking about is oftentimes what makes for an interesting photo is just a different perspective than what people are used to seeing. So people are used to seeing, you know, they say our eyes are like 35 to 50 millimeters but, or whatever. I don't know that I really buy into that because we have a really f wide field of view. But uh, OK, I, I've, I've got to say that is a load of crap. I've heard <laughs> the same thing. It's just I know. a load of crap. I don't know why people say that. It's, it's that, like, like 50 millimeters is normal. No, it's not. Your it's, eye would be like a two millimeter lens right. you can see so what it, it, it would be like 35 millimeters if they didn't take into consideration peripheral view it's like we only really are paying attention to 35 it's too complex but anyways i digress um so people are really used to that it's too those, complex for our simple minds Nick. <laughs> people are really used to those Something. middle focal length ranges probably just because every point and shoot camera they yep. typically are shooting at that. And they're also really used to seeing photos from eye level. And so when you see a cell phone photo from eye level, it looks like every other cell phone photo that's ever been taken. But suddenly, if you either shoot with a really long focal length or a really wide focal length, uh, get really down low to the ground or get really high off of the ground with a drone, those different perspectives make for interesting photos. And the interesting photos like that will have more impact with the person viewing it. So um, a lot of times, just a different perspective, like using a long lens or seeing a, a scene that most of us don't get to see, like the tip of Mount Everest. Um, those make for really compelling photos because they're different and it's something that we're not used to looking at. Yeah, recently I went to, um, to, to Southern, Southern Utah, Utah with, with you, you and, and Brian, Brian McGuckin, McGuckin was there. Was there. And, and one, one of my, my very, very favorite, favorite photos, photos from, from the entire, entire trip, trip was, was a photo, photo that I took with the 7200. 7, uh, just, just, and, and the, the thing that I like, so it's a mountain peak. Uh, with, uh, with it's with just, just this, this beautiful, beautiful red, red rock, rock with a lot of texture, texture on it, and then, and then the, the fog's, fogs rolling, rolling in over it, over and, and the, the snow, snow was starting to cover on the mountain. The mountain. And, and I, I, I took several photos of this to try to get, a, 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 you know, to try, try to get the photo that looked right. And since I'm I'm still new to this long lens shooting for landscapes, it took me quite a few tries. Uh, but, uh, but the one, the one that, that I like the best shows, shows a, strip a strip of trees at the, at the bottom under, under the mountain, mountain. Mm -hmm. and it and gives it, it some, some scale and depth. depth. That's, the that's the real, real problem, problem with long lens photos is, is you're, you're getting, getting rid of the depth, depth. and that's, that's one, one thing, thing that, that, that makes, makes a photo, a photo feel, feel 
interesting. It makes it feel more 3D because right. it's obviously a flat picture. And, and so we need that, that kind of depth in there. Yeah. So that's a really important thing to mention is just because you're zooming in on a subject doesn't mean that you just fill the frame with the subject. You still have to kind of keep compositional ideas in mind, whether, you know, you're creating layers with the, the tree and then the mountain and then the clouds or wh whatever it is, or you're finding a pattern that is being broken by a lone tree, something like that. You still have to keep compositional ideas in mind. So um, like when I go to the Palouse, I have to, I'm shooting with a long lens, but that's all I can really do is like have compositional ideas because it's such a large wide vista that I could point my camera anywhere and just be kind of lost. But by looking for patterns or, or shapes, stuff like that, it gives you an idea of what might make a good photo rather than just filling the frame with a subject. There's a mountain. I take a picture of it. Bongo take picture. You know, you got to really uh, think about it and put a lot of thought into what it is and how you're crafting it and bongo and b bongo bongo <laughs> take picture click you know put a little thought into it <laughs> so not necessarily for long lens landscapes but you know this is a show for nature photography i mean it's just any kind of nature photography this is your show uh, but and so that also in, of course includes wildlife photography mm -hmm. and with that's always done with a long lens um, unless you have a death wish uh, shooting <laughs> shooting wild animals up close uh, but I've been testing out two really really popular lenses the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter sport and the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary so it's the exact same lens the exact same marketed uh, aperture even though it's not actually the same aperture which we'll which we'll talk about um, and but one is a thousand bucks less than the other. And the question for me is, is the one that's a thousand bucks less good enough that you don't need to pay the price and get get the real expensive sport? So, I, Nick, you've shot one of these lenses, right? Yeah, I've, I've shot the sport version. And, and what was your experience? Um, I loved it. It's a fairly heavy lens, as you, you're probably aware of now. It's um, the, the build quality is I, I get a hard time for just ranting and raving about the build quality on lenses, but the build quality is really, really good. It, to me, it feels every bit as good, if not better than some of the Canon L lenses. It's just built like a tank. It's made out of metal. It's got a really nice feel to it. Um, it's acceptably sharp while maybe it's not the fastest focusing lens in the world. But it does, uh, you can change those settings with the USB dock that Sigma makes. Um, and in my tests, I didn't have the, the Sigma dock to actually like play with the settings. Um, but I liked it. Um, it. It's definitely comparable to the Canon 100-400, which is a completely different lens, different focal length, different size for sure. Uh, what are you thinking about the contemporary lens? Because I don't, I don't have any experience with that. Yeah, so the the sport is super heavy. Like if somebody is to to break into the house, I'm reaching for the sport and I'm just gonna <laughs> bash them over the head. Like exactly. this is your tool. That's what you want to use. But the contemporary, I actually prefer, and it's a thousand dollars less, which is always nice, right? Like yeah. even if the price was the same, I would say the contemporary is the the better lens overall. Really? So the reasons to choose the contemporary one is I mentioned earlier it has a faster aperture and they're the same you know marketed it's the same aperture but the question is you know it's a variable aperture at, at you'll get f5 when you're at you know 150 millimeters but when you're at 600 millimeters you'll be at f6.3 as your max aperture so the question is when does it change and the contemporary lens is going to give you about 60 millimeters in there a 60 of the most usable millimeters where we'll pretty commonly be shooting uh, you're getting a third of a stop better light. So that's that's nice, but not a deal breaker by any means. Mm -hmm. The deal breaker, however, is when we look at sharpness tests. So I spent a long, long, long time doing sharpness tests with this uh, lens. Uh, I mean, I, I did the test and then I was like, nah, that, that just can't be right. And so I would redo the test. And uh, after a long time, uh, I, I just decided that the Sigma Contemporary is just a hair sharper. I mean, we're, we're really splitting hairs to even talk about a difference in sharpness here, but, 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 but there, there is, is a, a very, very slight, slight difference, difference at, at some, some of the focal, focal lengths and at some 
um, aperture, aperture settings, settings. and I, I've, I've, I've just, just got to say the, the contemporary is a hair sharper at some of the focal lengths. So a tiny, tiny bit better sharpness. We're getting a faster aperture. And then the, the of course, it's it's $1,000 cheaper, but the biggest difference is the weight of, of mm -hmm. the two lenses. The contemporary weighs, the, I mean, it's, it's almost two and a half, three pounds. So it's like the weight of a chihuahua lighter than the <laughs> weight of the Jeez. sport. That's a big deal. Yeah. Um, uh, chihuahuas are not to be, to be taken lightly. <laughs> uh, and you know, you're carrying that all the time, but then it affects more than that. When a lens gets heavier, I mean, you think about that poor focus motor. It's not just pushing the lens. It's pushing a chihuahua on the lens <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's that much heavier. And so the lighter lenses generally focus a little bit heavier uh, than the fo heavier ones if all else is equal. Uh, my best guess is is that Sigma has put essentially the same focus motor in these lenses uh, because uh, th the contemporary is focusing just a hair lighter. I mean, you think about that battery in your camera. It's this tiny little battery that's powering not only the computer of the camera, but it's also that's the energy that's used to push that lens in and out. It's not much. And so when your lens gets real big and real heavy, it's not super fast to focus. And that was actually the the thing that surprised me the most the very first time I used one of those, you know, $10,000, you know, Nikon 600 millimeter F4s. I mean, it's a beautiful lens, but if you're used to shooting portrait lenses, landscape mm -hmm. lenses, the shorter stuff, the first thing you're going to notice is, man, this thing focuses like a turtle right? Uh, yeah. compared to what you're used to. And so with these big lenses, lightness is a big deal because it also affects the autofocus performance. Yeah. So another thing that you're getting with the sport lens that you're not getting with the contemporary lens is weather sealing, right? Like the contemporary pretty much doesn't have weather sealing. Okay. That's, that's, that's a common misconception. Okay. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of time researching into that because uh, a lot of the reviews say the contemporary lens has no weather sealing. And that's not true. What what Sigma says, and this is why it's confusing. It's not our fault. It's Sigma's fault for making <laughs> this confusing. They say the contemporary lens has is dust and splash proof and weather sealed mount, but the the sport lens is a weather sealed construction. So weather sealed construction versus weather sealed <laughs> mount. Using um, different terminology. Like yeah, <laughs> I'm not totally sure what that means. I would love to see a couple teardowns of this lens to see, you know, what mm -hmm. actually where the gaskets are and everything to see um, how this has, has been weather sealed. But, um, but anyway, the sport at least is marketed as having better weather sealing. Uh, but but they do have both some weather sealing. That's all I can say. Interesting. So it, I, I don't know if you have any experience with the Canon 100 to 400 version two. No, um, I haven't tried it. Okay, so I've shot both the, the Sigma Sport and the version two of the 100 to 400. The weight is a huge difference between the two. The, the 100 to 400 weighs about half as much. Um, so it's very easily hand holdable. Uh, Sigma 100 to 600 is holdable for a while. And then you, you then your bicep starts getting sore. And then you're like, well, I just kind of want to put it on a tripod. <laughs> you, you lose. You go back to the hotel for a yeah, while, guys. Yeah, you <laughs> lose your grit after the first uh, half hour of shooting with it. The 100 to 400, you can hand hold that thing all day long. It's about like shooting a 70 to 200. Um, 100 to fo 400 focuses really fast. It's lightning fast focusing, much faster than the 150 to 600. But the reason for that is because you got smaller glass and less focal length. So um, if you're not needing 600 millimeters, which we all need 600 millimeters, right? Like when you go to buy a lens, you pretty much want to buy the longest one you can because that's the whole point of buying a long lens is their zoom way out there. But 100 to 400 is focuses really fast. It's really nice and light. So if you don't need 600 millimeters, I definitely, I think that's probably the lens that I would be looking at personally. 
And and so what do you think? I mean, do you think the the you know lightness and the, the maybe a little bit sharper of the Canon is worth the the price of of not having those 200 mil. Oh man, I don't know. That's hard. It depends on whether you're photographing like hummingbirds or like pterodactyls, right? So if you're shooting pterodactyls, 100 to 400 is enough. If you're shooting hummingbirds, you need those 600 millimeters because neither one of these are going to perform very well with the tele extender on it. And I know your love for tele extenders. I, my <laughs> love is pretty similar. Like it just ruins the, ruins the image quality in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. And, and slows down the focusing. It does a whole bunch of nasty things. Um, but man, it, it's really tough. Like if, if you need 600 millimeters, like if you need it, like I need coffee in the morning. If you really, really need it, <laughs> 600 millimeters go for the Sigma for sure. But uh, if you're going to be using it for a mix of a little bit of landscape photography, a little bit of um, uh, wildlife photography, I would go for the 100 to 400 because remember, you still have to carry these things places. And that 100 to 400 is going to be a lot more enjoyable to carry than the 150 to 600. So it, it depends on what you shoot. If you shoot hummingbirds, uh, you definitely need those longer focal lengths. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And, you know, having done quite a bit of pterodactyl photography <laughs> myself. It's I, kind of a connoisseur. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you need the 600 millimeters. I think if you're, if you're doing wildlife photography, uh, recently when I was in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone, you know, it's a lot of big game. We're talking right. about buffalo uh you know coyote is reasonably big elk and stuff um and still i mean when i look through my my best photos from the week eh, i bet 80 percent of them were shot at 600 millimeters or close to 600 millimeters yeah. uh, there really just isn't such thing as too long for for wildlife photography so for me a 400 millimeter lens is useful for a lot of things including some wildlife photography where you know you're going to be close to a larger animal but uh, it's also useful for sports if we're going to shoot you know weekend sports something like that mm -hmm. uh, a 400 millimeter lens even if it's not super fast for outdoor daylight sports is, is a great choice but for wildlife oh man you really want that 600 millimeters and in fact i was shooting these these sigma lenses on the canon 70 mark ii uh, so, I mean, that's really a 900 millimeter lens if you're mm -hmm. taking into into consideration the crop factor. Uh, and still, it, it just often wasn't long enough. I, you really can't, you just can't have too long for wildlife photography. Right. So it, it definitely depends on whether you're doing landscape photography with a little bit of wildlife mixed in, or if you're primarily a wildlife photographer with a little bit of landscape photography mixed in. It kind of depends on the mix of things you're doing. Um, so... It, kind of throwing this back to landscape photography, I've mentioned in the past that I recently got the Mindshift Rotation 180 backpack. And while I love that that particular backpack, you cannot fit a telephoto lens in that thing for anything. You can, you can take it off of your camera, take the lens hood off, and it'll fit somewhere, but not in a very... Uh, uh, I don't know, not in a very good way, <laughs> but, um, one of these 150 to 600s would not fit anywhere in that, that particular bag. So that's one of my biggest complaints about, uh, my favorite bag is that I can't put long lenses in it because of that on trips where I'm going to be doing only landscape photography, I've really been playing around with the idea of getting that Canon 70 to 300 L. Uh, what's so nice about that. I've shot it in the past. I've done a review on it. Um, they're really short. They're like uh, almost as short as like a seven, uh, as a seven, a 24 to 70, um, and weighs just a tiny bit more. And if you're doing landscape photography, the last thing you really want to do is be packing a big, heavy lens uh, like a, a 70 to 200 f 2.8 or a 150 to 600. Um, so I, for landscape photographers, I've, I would really recommend the 70 to 300 L or you can get the 70 to 200 f 4, which is like way, way lighter than the, the 70 to 200 f 2.8. So um, that's one of the things I've been thinking about because every time I go to pack my bag and I have to try to fit the 70 to 200 F 2.8 in that bag, 
I, I end up switching to my F-stop bag because I can't make it fit. I can't put it anywhere in my bag mounted and that just annoys me. I have to take it off and then put, put it on either a body cap or a different lens and it's just really annoying. So um, that's one of the downsides of that particular bag. <laughs> Nick rant number two. <laughs> Nick rant number two. Well, I, I have this the same bag, a little bit different version of it. So you have the, the Mindshift Gear Rotation 180 Professional. Mm-hmm. And I have the Rotation 180 Horizon, which right. is the one size smaller down of that. Uh, but I'm not shooting full frame cameras anymore. I've ditched them and I'm shooting uh, the Fuji system right now. Uh, but, I, you know, I say I shoot the Fuji system, but like right now within arm's reach of me, I have a Canon and a Nikon DSLR as well. Because I'm always switching around just trying to review uh, different bags and stuff. But in this, in the Horizon version, with the, the Fuji equivalent of those lenses, I can totally fit uh, that 70 to 200, which in this case is nice. the 50 to 140. The way that I do it is I just have the dividers going horizontally halfway down, and then um, you can fit the camera with the lens on it above it, and then below I can fit an, an additional lens or two down there as well. Um, and then for the 150 to 600, at least in the Horizon version, I'm, I'm frankly not sure what, what exactly it looks like in, in your bag, but in the Horizon version, there's a huge open top pocket. And there mm. I've bought a lens organizer to fit up there. And there I could fit, I mean, a magnificently giant lens. I'm sure it would okay. fit the 150 to 600 up there. Uh, but I don't know what that's like in, in the professional either. Uh, so uh, would either of those be options for you? Or do you think it just wouldn't fit with the DSLR uh, size? You, so I've got the, the, the optional ICU unit. And so I, I'm dealing with that a lot of times where you open up the back and and maybe if I took that ICU out and put some kind of different organizational thing in there, I might be able to put it in mounted, but then I lose all of that useful storage. So man, I, anytime I'm shooting with a long lens, I t- typically go for my F-stop bag. It's the tilopia bag. Um, it's kind of one of their most popular sizes. And just because I can throw anything I want in there mounted to my camera and it's going to fit. That's nice. And so I don't have to think about it. It doesn't matter whether it's my 16 to 35 or my uh, 150 to 600. I can just throw it in the bag, uh, maybe reverse the lens hood and it'll fit. No, no worries there. So, um, but if I'm going to do landscape photography only, I really like having that rotation 180 because it's nice to not have to take your bag off for everything. With the f-stop bag, I tend to throw it on the ground all the time. So it's a filthy, filthy bag. It's so dirty. But my rotation 180 is sparkling clean because it never touches the ground. I don't have to. Um, but that only works if I'm using wide angle lenses or shorter lenses. So I'm thinking about getting the 70 to 300 just for that bag. And it, how silly am I to think about buying a lens so it fits my bag rather than buying a bag that fits my lens? <laughs> I've got uh, well, a sick. <laughs> uh, it, it's a sickness. You're a sick, sick person. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I can totally see that. And in fact, that's, that's why I switched to mirrorless is it was just too much. Mm. Uh, the weight and the size of the DSLR stuff kept me from making the photos that I wanted to uh, and getting the gear to where I needed it to be. But I want to I want to kind of end with a little bit uh, less gear talk and more of a, well, I guess it's still kind of a kind of gear talk, but um, maybe less specific is are these new lenses this new brand of you know the tamron 150 to 600 the sigma 150 to 600 the canon 100 to 400 is this a new shift in wildlife photography uh in seven eight years when i when i go to the popular wildlife photography hotspots, am i still going to be seeing the serious guys on the ginormous tripod with the ginormous lens and the gimbal head uh, or do you think this is a shift to a much lighter weight way to approach wildlife photography where you may not get photos that are as sharp you may not have quite as mm-hmm. much reach uh, but you can more easily you know move around and get the photo what do you think i think that those elite wildlife photographers are still going to use the elite gear But the thing is, at those wildlife spots when you go there, instead of just having the elite guys that are able to get the shot, you're going to have like 20 other amateurs that can now get the shot as well just using more affordable gear. So I think I feel like good wildlife photography, the the bar of entry 
or the, you know, the cost of entry has dramatically dropped because before these lenses, it was a seriously expensive endeavor to try to shoot at those focal lengths. You were either, oh, yeah. you know, adding all kinds of teleconverters and you didn't have very good image quality or you were spending six to $7,000. And now for like, you know, under $2,000, you can get a really decent 600 millimeter lens. Um, so I, I just feel like the, the cost of entry has dramatically lowered and like all other aspects of nature photography, there's going to be more people doing it because, you know, there's lots of people that would love to be able to go out and do wildlife photography. They just couldn't afford it. And now I think that they can. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I agree with you for the most part, for the most part, I, I went to Yellowstone, uh, I guess three years ago, two years ago, and I used the big nasty 600 millimeter F4 and uh, you just got to love doing that. Like oh, it's yeah. fun with those things. Um, but I can't tell you how many shots I missed that were cool. Uh, you know, you see the fox on the side of the road. By the time you pull over, pull out the tripod, put the, the camera on the gimbal, it's get it all gone. set up, yep. uh, and point it at the fox. It's gone. I mean, so gone. Uh, and you, I mean, you can do some things. You can try to shoot out the window and stuff, but then you're only windows height. You know, they're just huge limitations to using that kind of gear. This year, I went back with one of these super zooms. And what I expected is, eh, you know, I'm going to get okay photos, but they just won't be quite as sharp, won't look as professional. I don't know. We'll give it a try because uh, I really wanted to review these lenses because I had a lot of listeners mm -hmm. asking about them. And looking at the photos from both trips, I got way better photos from this most recent trip where I was using that super zoom. Uh, I just, I had the exact same focal length as that big, big heavy lens. Uh, frankly, I wasn't shooting the big heavy lens at F4 anyway, because if you shoot a bison at F4, you know, its <laughs> eyeballs are going to be in focus and the whole body is going to be out of focus, like 90% yep. of the animals out of focus. So I often find myself stepping, stopping down a little bit when I'm shooting animals anyway. And so I, I just saw a massive benefit um, to right. using these super zooms drawbacks as well, but uh, also some massive benefits. Well, and not to mention like one of the most uh, useful aspects of these super zooms is that they, they zoom. And so, you know, yeah. if yeah, you've, if you've ever tried to shoot a 600 millimeter prime and track something, it is, it is impossible. <laughs> you see a bird in the sky, you look, you try to find it, it and you can't find it in your viewfinder. You have to, so like, um, even when I was shooting the uh, the the NFL game with the 120 to 300 millimeter, it's a f 2.8 from Sigma, and anytime you're shooting something that's moving, it's nice to start at your wide side of your zoom range, find the action, and then zoom in on it, and then you can you can quickly find it, zoom in on it, and then focus and get your shots. Um, it, shooting birds in flight, it's the same way. It's so much easier to start at your wide, wide side of your focal range, zoom in on it, then focus, get your shots. You can't do that with a prime lens. You might get better image quality, but your keeper rate is just going to tank because you can't find it. And by the time you do find it, it might not be in a favorable or a you know photogenic position. So um, you are going to get way more shots with the one with lenses like this, just because you can zoom out, zoom back in, and you have a nice versatile lens that you can leave on rather than okay, here's the 600, I'll get that shot. Now I want to switch over to the 70 to 200 and get a wider shot. You can get all of that with just one lens. And so it's going to be very useful that way too. Well, well we, we always, always want, want to leave you, leave you with a little, little inspiration, inspiration as we, as we sign, sign out. out. And, and this, this week, week we, we want, want to, mention, to mention, of course, course Michael Fry, Fry, who we, we talked, talked about a little bit more at length earlier. earlier. Uh, but, uh, but if you, but want, you want, want to learn this long lens technique, just looking at his photos can really help to give you that uh, that eye for this. And he has some great eBooks and other things as well if you want to learn a little bit more from him. And I also want to refer you over to improvephotography.com where I've posted that full review of the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary and sport. If you're looking at buying either one of these lenses and being able to take wildlife photography, uh, I mean, for $980, I think is what the contemporary is going yeah, for. That's, good. that's pretty cool. And I have lots of sample shots on there. Nick, it was good chatting with you. Everybody, thanks for listening, and we will see you in another seven days.